Good morning. Hi, New City. I have the honor of doing a few things this morning. Uh, one, we're kicking off an Advent sermon series today called Unto Us a Child is Born. That means that each week for the next four weeks, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into the four names Isaiah uses to describe this coming agent of healing and righteousness, right? The four names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So that's exciting, and I know the teaching staff is excited about that. The second thing I'm doing today is much more difficult and personal and emotional for me. And today's, today's sermon marks the last sermon that I'll preach as a pastor with New City for the foreseeable future. And my desire is to share my heart and my hopes with you as we move into this season of being apart. I have a lot of love for you, church. I'm just scrolling through here. Scroll here real quick. Look at some of your faces. A lot of love for you guys. And I know that you all have a lot of love for me. I feel that. And so I'm, I'm well aware of that. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope to leave you with encouraging words that lift you, encouraging words that embolden you toward your truest self, toward a renewed sense of communal intimacy, toward your God-given purpose, and toward the God of unflinching hope. So we'll see how that goes. But for now, let's read the Isaiah passage as we move into this season of Advent, where we begin anticipating and remembering Emmanuel, the God who comes to be with us. Isaiah 9, 2 through 6. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you join me in prayer? God, be with us now, we ask. God, help us to uh, deepen our understanding, deepen our heart's understanding, deepen our life's understanding of what you've called us to, of the situations that we live in, that we would see honestly and soberly, and yet catch a glimpse of that unflinching hope. God, be with us now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So here we are at the cusp of 2021. And how did we make it here? <laughs> I really think that 2020 was that level of Jumanji where you get sucked into the game until someone rolls a five or an eight. Except for it's like the entire world got sucked in. My favorite 2020 twist came this past week when researchers discovered a mysterious metallic monolith in the middle of a remote canyon in Utah. 
my plea with these people is no, no, just leave it alone. Save it for another year. Save it for another decade. We don't need to make alien contact in 2020. That's just not in the cards for us. I don't want to know. But in all seriousness, think back over your experience of this year. What memory comes to mind? Just take a second. Think about that. What memory comes to mind? It was March 15th, I think, the day that, oh, the memory that comes to mind for me uh, was moving our worship service to that hybrid in-person online gathering. I think it was March 15th. That feels like a lifetime ago. I remember how strange and exciting and different it all felt for a moment. Setting up the instruments in the office, figuring out the live stream, getting the word out to the church that we were doing this transition. It had this feeling of being new, this feeling like we're all in this thing together. And of course, that was before I really fully understood the gravity of the situation we were all walking into. Not long after that, curfews were introduced. Businesses, schools, and church gatherings were shut down. Many uh, mass testing sites opened up. Kids were locked indoors. Parents were managing chaos at home while trying to work. We were captive to an invisible threat. Workers in mass were losing their work. Essential workers trekked on with fear and out of necessity. We were fearing for our parents, our elderly, our children, our friends, even ourselves. And I'd be lying if I said that we were beyond it, right? You know this. Just last week or so, restaurants in LA County had to shut down in-person dining again and LA County instituted another curfew because of a surge in the virus. We're very much still in the midst of this painful, life-changing period of history. And in the midst of that sustained upheaval, the stress and chaos that regularly meets us in daily life was still meeting us in daily life. You and I still have bills. We still have unexpected expenses. We still have chronic conditions. We have children who still have needs, still have anniversaries and birthdays and deadlines and meetings, losses and heartache. Hurt and betrayal are deeper devastations in the midst of this pandemic disruption. The stings, they sting more. The loneliness is more lonesome. The conflict is more biting. Right? Not to put too fine a point on it, but friends, we've been through it. We have changed. You have changed. I have changed. The course of life has changed for so many of us. These have been hard, uncertain, and anxious times for many of us. And the crucibles we've been in still go on for many of us. Is that true for you? Is that true for someone you know? In our Isaiah passage today, the people of Judah experienced a similar desperation in the face of uncertainty and threat to their well-being. The context of Isaiah 9 tells us that the Judean king named Ahaz resisted his friend's call to form a military coalition against Assyria, their rulers to the north. See, the kingdoms of Israel and Syria wanted Judah to form a military opposition against Assyria. But the Judean king was afraid of going against Assyria because he might need their protection against enemies in the future. Enemies whose threat and whose domination were increasing. It was in this uncertainty and threat that Judah began to wonder, where is the God who promised to be our faithful protector? 
Where is God? Is God present? Maybe you've been asking yourself that question in the face of constant uncertainty and threat. Where is God? Why God? Or maybe you're too appropriate to even think to ask that question. But now that you're thinking about it, you realize you may have been wrestling with anxiety and bitterness without naming it. Why God? Many of you know that these past two years were extremely difficult years for me, personally. I lost the most significant long-term relationship of my life to date, uh, to separation and divorce. There were months I found myself avoiding God, avoiding myself, angry, resentful, in denial, and in shock. How could this happen? More fundamentally, why would this happen? Why did this happen, God? This wasn't how it was supposed to play out. This wasn't in my cards. Was it in your cards, God? I found myself rocked to my core. What did I even believe about God and God's faithfulness anymore? During this period of time, I found myself writing song after song to process and deal with with the well of emotions and confusions that were mounting. This one lyric sticks out to me as a window into how I was feeling. Quote, he's not far from any one of us, it says. But sometimes it just feels like that verse is turned up on its head. I confess I've fallen hard over this past year, especially. It's been difficult to hold on to any semblance of hope in God sometimes. Like I said earlier, I am changed and changing. Does it ever feel like that for you? Have you rolled your eyes at your well-meaning friend or spouse or parent when they say, hang in there, God won't let you down? while you're in the middle of something devastating. That's okay. Here at the end of 2020, as winter rolls in, the nights are longer and the days are shorter, have you felt that darkness of the soul? Have you felt the anxiety of feeling yourself and your family in suspense and incomplete? Have you felt the gnawing tension of clinging to belief in God's goodness in the face of devastation and loss? It's against this bleak backdrop, against this dark night of uncertainty for Judah, that Isaiah prophesies an audacious hope, a a bewildering possibility. And it says, On those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. How can he say this? Judah's enemies advance as the nation sinks into deeper helplessness. And to boot, we know that the Babylonian exile is still to come at this point. So really, a light? Whether Isaiah knew it or not, his prophecy served a dual purpose, as biblical prophecies often do. Isaiah was speaking directly to the plight of the Judean people, with their present fears and experience of helplessness. The generation that received this prophecy might have thought he was referring to Hezekiah, King Ahaz's son. But as the Holy Spirit is prone to do, Isaiah was also speaking to every future generation, speaking of a deeper, more holistic, universal peace, a cosmic coming hope for all time. And it says, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. What's he saying? What is this? 
Isaiah is saying, there will be a time, there will be a time in human history where the light of God's justice and love shines into the darkness, redefining the landscape totally. A time when domination, when oppression, when violence, war, when bloodshed will be a thing of the past and the burdens we carry will only exist in history books and memoirs and journals. There will be a time in human history when affliction, alienation, isolation, scarcity, and the fear of destruction and judgment, when these things will dissolve. And what will remain? We will remain. No longer obscured by trauma, shame, or sin. No longer veiled from one another. No longer veiled from ourselves. But we will be before the face of God, existing in, a, in reality as it was meant to be. Isaiah here has an explosive, bold hope, a hope that echoes down through the generations, reaching us today, reaching us right now. And how does it reach you as you sit and you listen? How does it reach you? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how it reaches me. I'll be real honest. I tend to be a little cynical, and I might call it realistic. You all remember your grandmother or some other older person telling you, if it sounds too good to be true, that's because it is. Well, in the world as we know it and experience it in 2020, imagining Isaiah's glorious hope makes me want to do an eye roll of the soul, even as I long for it to be true, even as I long for its truth. Faith takes work, doesn't it? it takes effort. It takes effort to live in line with what we believe. And sometimes it's a tiring business, which is why the scriptures admonish us to, in, to endure to the end. Lord have mercy. How do we get from the world as it is? How do we get from the world as it is to the world that Isaiah is prophesying, to this glorious hope for the world? How do we trust that in the deep dark of winter, a light has shone? As I've experienced my life unraveling in various important ways this year, wondering anxiously and wondering insecurely what will become of me in the future, one thought above all others has given me steadiness and calm from time to time when it comes, right? It's a truth to which the scriptures bear witness here. And this is it. If there is a wonderful counselor, if there's a wonderful counselor, there is hope for a glorious future. Hope for my future, for your future, for the future of the world. So, And while, yes, the darkness is deep, the winter is long, the daylight wanes, if the truth behind all reality is that there is an all-wise one planning something wondrous, making beauty and goodness out of pain and loss, banishing violence and evil with loving divine movement toward us in the flesh. If that's true, then there is still hope. If there's a wonderful counselor. And the scandal of Advent is that no military tanks roll in to make these changes, no diplomatic mission, no government intervention, no decorated war veterans or Ivy League presidents, no lively debates, no exhausting political campaigns. Just a child, a lowly infant with God's redemptive mission pulsing through him, entering our pain and our plight with compassion. And that's why John, in his masterful description of Christ's incarnation, hearkens back to Isaiah 9. In John chapter 1, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
Because God in the flesh came to be with us, Emmanuel, hope lives on. And because Emmanuel is the all-wise one with wondrous plans for restoration and peace, we can dare to hope even in the midst of chaos and uncertainty. If we can stretch out our hands, our tired hands, to grab just that, to try to grasp that, maybe we can find hope for another day. Even in darkness and longing, even today, Take that truth now and think about what you're facing, what your family is facing, what your finances look like, what your children, what your spouse or your parents, what your siblings and friends are facing, what the nation is facing. I want to give us a moment to reflect um, personally, to reflect honestly on this scandalous hope, this daring claim that God has come in the flesh to breathe with human lungs, to touch with our fingers, to walk in our dirt and sand, to feel the pangs of hunger and the sting of loss and abandonment, the pain of torture and weakness, God in the flesh, the all-wise one, planning something wondrous. What does it do for you? So take a moment now. I'll give us a few moments. I know that for me, I think about the pain of the loss of a love relationship, the feeling of uncertainty in the future. And I know Jesus didn't stand in the distance and shrug his shoulders. And he stepped in. He stepped in and dared to lift me up in my pain and as I trudged along and helped me to face the darkness. What does the news of this advent of this wonderful counselor do to inspire strength and faith in you today? And you can feel free to chat that in the box if you like. So while Advent requires us to imagine what it felt like to long for the Christ child to come 2,000 years ago in a manger, We know that Advent points us to the future, to our future longing, the very real longing we maintain as Christ's church for that day that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 9. Advent points us to, to long for the day when, like Isaiah says, when war boots are burned, when oppressive yokes and abusive rods are shattered by divine love and justice. When the all-wise one fulfills the divine plan for total restoration, personally, socially, systemically, cosmically. When I think about that, that's 
That's the hope that motivates me to continue working for a better world. If God promises to heal, if God promises to sanctify, if God promises to save and to unite all things together, well, I want my life to participate and share in that divine life. I want that. Church, if there's one thing I want to say during this last sermon of mine to encourage you, it's this. Believe in the kingdom. Dare to believe that the world you see around you, full of suspicion and alienation, scarcity and violence, dare to believe that it is not the world that has to exist. And it's not the world God intends for eternity. Dare to believe that your life matters. That your life makes a difference. Really. Sounds trite. But don't underestimate the rippling effects of your actions. For better or worse, your life matters. Start your days oriented towards the kingdom seeking its justice and righteousness and mercy as you live and move and have your being. Dare to believe that your witness together as a community of Jesus Christ matters here in Los Angeles, because it does. I pray that you, New City, would continue to be known for your love and tenderness towards broken people that you would continue to be known for your unconditional acceptance of people that our society considers refuse, that you'd be known as a people who shine light in bleakness as you imitate Christ. I ask you to press into the painful places of your heart, the tender places that we're so tempted to avoid with busyness, with socializing, with social media, with our favorite shows or substances or whatever else. Because if you go there, I promise you, God won't let you fall into oblivion. God won't let you fall into oblivion, the things that we'd rather not see. God is there seeking your healing. There really is so much good you can do together in Jesus' name if you continue to press into honest, brave, and authentic community. Community that laughs a lot. Community that seeks short accounts, that keeps short accounts with each other. A community that tells the truth in love and embodies this good news of Advent. It's the advent of this wonderful counselor that shines a light into our darkness, directs our paths, and sustains us in our sorrow. We don't know what the future holds, but a God who commits to holding us in the uncertainty and chaos that is certain to come, that is the God we meet in Scripture. the all-wise counselor planning something wondrous, a wonderful counselor. And I say this just as much to myself as to you. May we have the courage to trust that God. As we continue to walk into this Advent season, a deep winter upon us, I want us to listen to this song from The Brilliance. It's called A Light. Simple and meditative, you can close your eyes uh, and listen. Pastor James, can we get that on the screen? I put it in the slide. Just 
star of hope shines bright. A light shines bright. Shines bright Would you pray with me? God, you are the God of all time Of past, present, and future Of eternity Our lives are in your mercy. Help us to enter this season, God, with a deepening of our sorrow, because that's honest, and a deepening of our hope with bravery, with courage. that a light has shone and the darkness has not overcome it. That takes work. That takes effort. Help us, God, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.